Chapter 3 Ernie was pressing buttons and flicking switches and pulling leaves and twisting knobs. He chirped and swayed and danced and whirled. He chanted his fish chants and sang his fish songs at the top of his voice. Fish, 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 fish. Fish, 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 fish. Fish in buckets, fish in bins, chop off the heads and tails and fins. Boil and sizzle with tomato sauce and slap them in a tin with a label, of course. Fish, 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 fish. Fish, 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 fish. Pots, perfect pilchards, spectacular sardines, magnificent mackerel, elegant eels. Haddock and herring and cod and squid, get them down your neck. Best thing you ever did. Fish, 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 fish. Fish, 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 fish. Fish in buckets and... Annie sighed. Whatever had happened to the nice, easy-going fella she used to know, she tapped him on the shoulder. No response. She thumped him on the back. No response. She walloped him and yelled into his ear, Ernie, Ernest Potts. He turned to her at last. Aha, about time, he said. Stan, where are you, lad? And he reached down and switched off the nearest machine. Ernie gasped. What on earth was she doing? He reached down to switch it back on when Annie said, Never mind, Stan. It's his day off. Day off? Says who? Says me, said Annie. It's a new rule. Look, I've written it down. She handed him a slip of paper. Rule one. Family members get a day off on their birthday. Ernie read it and scratched his head. You had rules in the shipyard, didn't you? Asked Annie. Yeah, but... No buts said Annie, and he also gets a £10 bonus. She handed him another slip of paper. Rule 1A, family members get a £10 bonus on their birthday. But you've just made these rules up, Ernie exclaimed. Annie shrugged. Of course I have. Are you objecting? She looked Ernie in the eye. He looked Annie in the eye. Yes, he said. She handed him another slip of paper. Rule 1B. Don't you dare object or I will go on strike. Well, Annie asked. Ernie grunted. He reached into his pocket and drew out a £10 note. Give it to Stan and tell him to have a good time, ordered Annie. She raised a finger as if to say, don't you dare object. Stan, she called. Come here, son. Uncle Ernie has something to tell you. Stan came out of the cupboard. You've got a day off, said Annie. Isn't that right, love? All right, grunted Ernie. And Ernie's got something for you, haven't you, Ernie? All right, grunted Ernie again. He held out the £10 note. Happy birthday, son, he said. Have a... He scratched. What were the words he was supposed to say? A good time, prompted Annie. That's it, said Ernie. Have a good time, lad. Where will I have a good time? asked Stan. And he opened the front door. Out there, she said. You've been cooped up too long in here. Have a good time out there in the world, son. Annie and Stan looked th out through the streets and they gasped in wonder and surprise because a fairground had come to town. There it was, slap bang in the place where Simpson's shipyard used to be. There was the ferris wheel turning slowly in the sun and the pointed top of a helter-skelter, the crackle of dodgems, the wail of music, the clatter of a roller coaster. There was the smell of engine oil and candy floss and hot dogs. A fair, they said together. Wow! Stan gripped his ten pounds tight and he kissed his aunt and grinned at his uncle and stepped out into his sunny day of freedom. Annie grabbed a shopping bag. Rule 1C, she said as she walked out. Aunts are allowed time off to buy birthday cakes. Ernie watched them go. World's gone balmy, he said to himself. Then he slammed the door and got back to work. Chapter four. Down went Stan through the terrace streets, past the shipwright's arms and the Salvation Army hostel and the Oxfam shop and the shuffling men. 
He ran across the waste ground to the fair. It was huge and noisy and bright, and the merry-go-rounds were turning, but it was still early, so hardly anybody was there. Just a handful of truants, a couple of women pushing ancient buggies, more glum-looking sh shuffling men, and the fairground folk themselves, with gold teeth and shocks of hair, silver studs glinting in their cheeks, and bags of clinking coins around their waist. They leaned on their rides and their stalls, swigged mugs of tea and smoked strange-smelling cigarettes. They stared at Stan as he stepped shyly by. They muttered together in strange accents. They coughed and cursed and spat and roared and with laughter. Stan rode a merry-go-round all alone, and he spun on the waltzer all alone. All alone, he rose in the air on the ferris wheel. He looked down on his world, the river, the terrace streets, the spaces where all the shipyards and factories used to be. He saw his old school, St Mungo's, and all the kids playing in the playground. He saw his own home in Fishkey Lane. He saw the steam from his uncle's machine seething through its roof. Round he went, up and down, round and round, and up and down. He saw the distant city and the distant mountains. He saw the glittering lovely sea going on forever. The deep blue lovely sky going on forever. He remembered his lovely mum and dad. And high up there in the sky, he shed a few quiet tears for them. He thought of his aunt and uncle and he gave thanks for them. He imagined the world beyond the sea and the universe beyond the sky and his head reeled at all the vastness of it all, the astonishingness of it all. Down at earth again, he ate a slithery hot dog and sticky candy floss. He licked his lips and his fingers and wandered past an ancient red and green gypsy caravan. Gypsy Rose was painted above its little doorway. A white pony stood beside it wearing a nose bag. A woman in a brightly patterned shawl came to the door. She beckoned Stan with her forefinger. I am the great-great-granddaughter of the true Gypsy Rose, she told him. Come inside and cross my palm with silver. I will fill your head with wonders and secrets in return. Stan the lick lit the last of the candy floss from his fingers. I will tell you when your time of troubles will be at an end, Gypsy Rose said. How do you know I've got trouble, said Stan. It's clear to them with eyes to see. What is your name, young man? Stan, said Stan. Give me just a single piece of silver, Stan, she said. She lowered her voice. Be brave and come inside. Stan was about to step into the caravan when his eye was caught by a flickering of gold. Goldfish. They were hanging in a line on a hook and duck school stall. There were 13 of them, tiny goldfish, each one swimming in a tiny plastic bag that dangled on an orange string and hung there in the sun. Without thinking, he moved away from Gypsy Rose towards the fish. Gypsy Rose spoke again. Farewell, she said. You are entranced. You will be dejected. You will be dejected. You will travel. And we will meet again. She went back inside. Stan moved closer to the hook and duck, hook -a -duck store. The bags were so tiny, the amounts of water so small. The fish were so lovely, so miraculous, with their golden skin and their gills and their fins and their panting mouths and their delicate scales and their tender dark eyes. He reached up towards one. Oi, what you doing, kid? Stan flinched. A man appeared standing inside the store below the fish. I said, what you doing? Stan shook his head. Just looking at the fish, he whispered. The man was a little, was little, with a shiny smooth face and black hair that came to a pointy widow's peak. He had a single golden earring. He wore ancient dusty red satin with splashes of grease on it. Behind him, dirty plastic ducks with hooks on their heads floated in endless circles on a green plastic pool. Beyond the ducks was an old caravan a girl stared gloomily out from its murky window. She rubbed the glass with her fingertip and made a tiny peephole and peered, peeped through it at Stan. No, just looking, snapped the man. You've got a winning boy, he pointed to a sign. Hook a duck, two pound a go, prize every time. 
Stan looked at his money. Less than two pounds left, not even enough for a single turn. But it's cruel, he protested. They've hardly got any water and they... The man just shrugged. You want to help them? You've got to win them, he said. He looked past Stan into the fair. Stan saw that the tiniest goldfish of all was hardly moving, was coming to a halt. But they're dying, he said. The man glanced at the fish, then shrugged again. They die, I'll get some more, he said. It's easy, but I could save them. How much you got, asked the man. One pound sixty-six, said Stan. The man pointed to the sign, two pound to go. Let's stop there.